Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Some of the first words that the Magi or wise men spoke when they came to Jerusalem were this. We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. There's a lot to be said just about that sentence, but let's focus first on just their phrase, his star. That's remarkable in and of itself. Have you ever pondered what it is that made them attribute a star to this king that they were coming to worship? And how it could be that there was a star that just appeared in the night sky and that they were able to recognize this star that made them take this journey of probably 700 miles from somewhere near Babylon to go and worship a king, a king that was not even born to their people. And that led them to believe that they should actually worship this king, who after all worships a king. There have been thousands of pages written in speculation about what it is that they actually had seen in that sky. Was it a star that God had caused to maybe never shine its light on this earth until that moment, or maybe in an explosion for a time, then this star shine in the sky that they were recognizing? Was it instead just a, a miracle that God made it so that this star, the light from it could actually travel to Bethlehem then and that they could be overjoyed when it moved and led them to the place where Jesus had been? There are even more questions about what prophecy were they even looking at that made them search the sky for such a star. Many have pointed to this prophecy from Numbers that we had read earlier this morning where Balaam had said, a star will come out of Jacob, a scepter will rise out of Israel. I don't know if you remember, maybe it was three years ago, I believe, when astronomers talked about a Christmas star that appeared in the sky just a few days before Christmas, where it was Jupiter and Saturn were so closely aligned that they looked like they were almost together. And astronomers said that this happened once every 400 years. Maybe it was something like that that had occurred. Whatever it is that happened, there is no doubt about this. It was a miracle from God. And it was God's providence that led the Magi to recognize that something special was happening there in Israel. And it was the working of God that made whatever prophecy they were reading take root in their hearts so that they knew that this king was a king for them too, and that he was worthy of their worship. And so the wise men followed that light. And as they followed it, knowing that it was a sign about the king of the Jews, they went to the most natural place to find this king, the capital city of that people, to Jerusalem. And yet even though they followed the light to that city of Jerusalem, when they got there, it seemed like they only found darkness. The city of Jerusalem was always supposed to be filled with the light of God. In fact, that's why it was built, how it was built, with the temple on the highest point of that city, the Temple Mount, and that every day, It was supposed to testify to the light of God that there were daily sacrifices and weekly sacrifices that were done there. So to remind the people of the result of sin, it means death and bloodshed, but to remind them that God had promised a great sacrifice that would crush the devil's head and pay for all their sins once for all. They had the festivals where the people of Israel gathered every year. All of them were supposed to gather there every year to be reminded of this light of God. At the Day of Atonement, when they took just one goat and they placed the hands of of the high priest upon it and therefore all the sins of all the people and sent it off into the wilderness to demonstrate that there would be one substitute to carry all the burden and the weight of the guilt of our sins. All the people would gather together for the Passover every year to be reminded about how God once rescued them from their slavery in Egypt and that one day, would rescue us from our slavery to sin and sin as well. And it, even though everything that was about that city, that surrounded that city, that was in the heart of that city, was supposed to point to this light of God, when the wise men got there, that is not what they found. They had journeyed these hundreds of miles to go worship this king that was to be born, and when they got there, I'm sure they expected that all of the city would be doing just as they were planning to do, worshiping this king that was to be born. But when they got there, they couldn't even find where he was. 
that Herod had to ask the chief priests and teachers of the law, where is this king even supposed to be born? And they pointed the words of the prophet Micah and said, it's in Bethlehem. And so now when they had found where it was that they were to go, I'm sure they expected many to follow them, but no one was willing to go with them. Well, maybe except one. Because we hear King Herod, after he had found out what it was that the prophet said about this king, he said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. The words sound good. But anyone who knew Herod knew that it's not what he meant. Herod was a monster. He was talented and ambitious. He was a great builder. He had built many ports and palaces. Even the temple there in Jerusalem was now called Herod's Temple because of the improvements that he had made there. But he was also crazy. So jealous for his throne that he had had there, he had had his wife and his brother-in-law and several of his sons killed because he was jealous that they might take his throne. And now as he was coming to the end of his own life, he had people, many of the, the greatest well-respected leaders of the city imprisoned and the order given that when he would die, that those people would be killed so that there would be mourning in Jerusalem and his death instead of rejoicing. And so when the scripture says that Herod was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him, it was because they knew that some more destruction was about to come. The wise men went searching for the light. They followed the light of the star, but all they found was darkness in spite of the fact that they had all of these signs from God that were part of their everyday ritual every year, every week. But maybe it was because of that that it had become so much of their ritual and habit that the meaning had been lost. And the people took it for granted and no longer saw the light that God was trying to shine in their lives. I can't help but feel that at times we fall into the same trap when things become ritual or routine or just so common in our lives. I think one illustration is that of Christmas. That as after Thanksgiving takes place and December is coming into our calendars, there is a lot of excitement for the days that lead up to Christmas. We sing carols, we bake cookies, we plan trips or gatherings with friends and family. We purchase presents and wrap them up and decorate our homes and, and our churches. And then Christmas comes, and if you're like me, it is a day that is filled with excitement. Those worship services on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, there it's hard to compare the rest of our worship services to those festival services because we are reminded so vividly about the miracle it is that God who exists outside of this world would actually come into this world and be contained in human flesh so that he could be our substitute and savior. There's reason that our hearts overwhelm on those days. But then the next Sunday comes and the next, and the next, and the days are short, and, and it's bound to snow in considerable amounts someday, and, and it's cold. And then it's easy for our attitude to become just as cold as the temperatures. It's easy for us to act like the people of Jerusalem and to take these things for granted, what it is to mean to come into this place and to hear about what God has done and to worship him like the Magi had intended to do. But it is eternally dangerous to take for granted the gifts that God continues to give us, to take for granted the, the font of baptism in which we have the privilege to God call, call God our Father, to be part of his family, to even approach him in worship because he has placed his name on you and made you his special possession, his dear own child. To take for granted the altar where God continues to come to us with his very own body and blood. To take for granted God's word where he continues to speak to us about the light. The light that shines in a world of darkness. It can be so easy to be like Jerusalem. Maybe not disturbed when we hear the message of God. But to take it for granted at times. Or maybe even worse when God's word speaks against something in our lives that we want to have for our future it's easy for us to reject it and say, maybe that's not a thing that we want to hear at this moment in our life. 
I once read that moths were designed that it's in their nature to navigate their course by the moon and the stars in the sky. I had read that they were like old time sailors that used those astrolabes to look at the stars in the sky and make sure they knew their course. So that's how moths knew how to get from one destination to another as many of them migrated. And that all worked great until the invention of the electric light bulb. And now they find this artificial light irresistible and they are distracted and it leads them to confusion and many times even death because they can't find their true source of light to guide them. And the electric light bulb is a blessing. It's a great thing. But even for them, and sometimes for us, it can become a curse. I sometimes feel like we too can be distracted by many good things that are blessings in our life to distract us from what is the true light in our lives. At this time of year, there are many blessings that come into our lives. Gatherings with family and friends, the opportunity to look at uh, opportunities to give gifts to others, to show love and appreciation. There are many other things through the course of our whole lives, our vocations, fruitful tasks, that these are all blessings from God. And yet at times they can be like artificial lights that we find them to be more important than the one true light that has won our eternity. So what is the solution? The solution is to every day to return to the mirror and recognize what it is true about us. That we have nothing to offer to God on our own. That in fact, we are corrupted so much that often we look at even opportunities to worship as something that we can take or consume from the Lord. And that every single thing in our lives, the, the talents of our own hands or minds, even all of creation, none of these things are things that we deserve from God. They all are by his good and gracious hand. And yet it's so easy for us to take them for granted because of just how corrupt we are by nature. But then after we do that every day and recognize our unworthiness before the Lord, to also recognize what the magi, what the wise men recognized as well of just how special of a gift it is that the eternal God, the one who is transcendent, that by his very nature exists outside of creation, that he came into this creation to be just like you and I, to be our perfect substitute. That this Christ child was born and that he lived and died and rose again so that you could be called God's special possession to be part of his very own family. And that we would look at opportunities in our lives to just stand and worship the Lord. The word worship means to ascribe worth to something. And that is really what the wise men came to do, just to, to say that this child that was born, he is worth their precious gifts, worth their time, worth their travel, worth their attention. And for us to look at this opportunity that we have today and really every day to just say, this is what God is worth to declare what he has done and to give him our time and our devotion because of what he has done for you. The gifts that the Magi brought, they, they foretold Jesus' future, whether they knew it or not. They brought Jesus gold because they recognized that he was a king and that he deserves all wealth and power. But Jesus was not a king like Herod. He was a king that led out of love. And he led against the, uh, against the enemy of sin and death and the devil. And he won that victory all on his own so that those enemies would be, be defeated for his people. They brought him incense, which was used in the temple as a symbol of the prayers of the people that went before God's throne. Because he is the way that we have access to God's throne. And he is the one intercessor so that God Here's your prayers. And they brought a myrrh. Myrrh, which was usually used at burials. And no doubt was part of the spices that the women were bringing to the tomb on that Easter Sunday. To remind the people and you that this child was born for one purpose. To fulfill all of God's law on our behalf, but then to die innocently on the cross. 
but then would ra be raised victoriously to demonstrate that death has been defeated forever. And so that is your treasured possession as well. And so on this day, as we celebrate Epiphany, which is often called the Gentile Christmas, we recognize that Jesus has been born to be the Savior of all people. And here we see these people from different backgrounds, from, from different nations coming and worshiping the king that was theirs as well. And recognize that this king, he continues to come to us, not in fear, but in love. And no matter what our backgrounds are, that each of our stories of how God has come to you, they each are different. But that he continues to come to us each day through his sacraments and through his word to remind us of that love and mercy of God. And so on this day, let's have that same attitude as the wise men. To just look for opportunities to worship the king of life. To ascribe worth to him to say he is worth our time and attention, our, our number one devotion, because he made you his number one priority as well. And for us to take these moments to just bask in the glory of God and proclaim together what it is that God has done for you. And so in a moment, we will say together the Nicene Creed, which really does just that. It is an opportunity for us to confess our faith together and be unified in that faith, but it's also an opportunity for us to worship to say, this is who God is. This is what he has done for me and all people. And so let's not just use that opportunity, but all opportunities to be like the wise men and give our worship to the king because he is worthy of our praise and thanks. In his name, the king of the Jews, the king of all nations, the king of light, your savior Jesus. In his name, amen.